Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Donald Cohn. Don is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and currently serves as an external member of the Financial Policy Committee at the Bank of England. Don is also a 40-year veteran of the Federal Reserve System, including serving as a governor and then vice chair of the Board of Governors from 2002 to 2010. Don joins us today to discuss his career as well as some of his recent work. Don, welcome to the show. Thank you, David, for having me on. I'm looking forward to this. Well, it's a real treat to have you on. You're, you're quite the uh, all-star. You've, you've worked your way through the uh, Federal Reserve System. You started at the Kansas City uh, Federal Reserve Bank and then to the Board of Governors. And I want to start there with your career at the Board of Governors. You came in there in 1975, which means you were there when Arthur Burns was chairman of the Fed. So please tell us any insights into that period. So I did come in from the, I was at the Kansas City Fed from 1970 through the middle of 1975. Okay. Um, I had several of my colleagues at the Kansas City Fed had migrated to the Board of Governors, people that I was close to in Kansas City and people that I uh, respected a lot and liked interacting with. And they kept saying, it's really cool back here in Washington. There are so many people at the board that know a lot. There's nothing you can think of that someone hasn't already thought about. And this is a really great place to work right at the center of policymaking. So they convinced me that um, this was a good place to come, and they were right. So it's, it was great fun. Of course, 1975 and the latter part of the 70s were uh, an exciting, interesting time <laughs> for the U.S. economy. The and great certainly inflation. Right? The great inflation at the Federal Reserve, and the Fed was wrestling with how to get control of this thing, what to do, what it had to do. Arthur Burns – was a very demanding person to work for. Now, I was a lowly staffer, but in that position, I briefed the board on recent financial developments every couple of weeks. There was a weekly briefing for the Board of Governors. Someone would brief on non-financial developments. People would brief on the money supply and credit growth, and people would brief on financial markets, and I had the financial market piece he was very exacting, and he uh, knew the data very well, and he held your feet to the fire and held you. He could be very dismissive if he didn't believe what you were telling him and you couldn't support what you were doing. It was a very scary experience. There was one person whose name I fortunately forget that I was <laughs> told that before this person came down to brief Arthur Burns and the board, he had to take a little courage uh, <laughs> from his desk, a little liquid courage spirits, uh, huh? uh, to, uh, to do this. But um, – and it wasn't a good time for the Federal Reserve. And I think Burns himself gave a talk called The Agony of Central Banking. And he didn't feel the Fed had – there were forces outside the Federal Reserve that were contributing this inflation. He didn't want to take the very hard steps necessary to to deal with those forces – he wasn't – my impression maybe from my briefing of him was that he didn't tolerate alternative views very well. He was dealt a bad hand. I mean there were oil price shocks. Um, a lot of union wages were indexed and sure. tied to the CPI. So there was certain momentum to this thing. But I also think he didn't – the cards he was dealt, he didn't play very well. And it took Paul Volcker to come in and demonstrate that when a central bank wants to achieve price stability, a central bank can achieve price stability. Let me ask about Athanasios Orfanidis' research on this period. So he has some really maybe provocative but nonetheless interesting work on this period. And he argues that and contrary to like John Taylor's work and others, he claims that if you look at real-time data from this period – the Federal Reserve actually was following a Taylor rule fairly closely. The only problem was is like the potential real GDP or output gap data was really bad in real time. And and so that's part of the story, which is ignorance or not having good data. 
as a staffer, what what is your take on on that literature, his his work? So I think that certainly contributed. And remember, the Friedman Phelps thing was from the late '60s, so it was just permeating the profession. The expectations augmented Phillips curve was just permeating the profession okay. through the 1970s. And identifying the Nehru, which is what Athanasius was talking about, the output gap, um, was, was, uh, it wasn't entirely new, but it was getting new emphasis with, with respect to inflation. And then the inflation expectations part also was so important. So I think, um, that undoubtedly contributed. But my, and I've had discussions with Athanasius about this. It seems to me that when you're trying something and you see that it's not working, that inflation is rising faster than you thought it would, um, then you should go back and question your premises okay. maybe more quickly than they did. So I can see that this might have contributed, but I think as Paul Volcker demonstrated that it doesn't have to control your behavior. And when you see it's not working the way you thought it should, you need to take very um, decisive steps to deal with the thing. And and Arthur Burns or G. William Miller, who followed him for a year and a half or so, um, wasn't willing to take those steps. Well, let's talk about Paul Volcker. So you worked with him. You worked through a very tough time to be a central yes. banker. Right. Um, I, I One of my first... Uh, Forays into macroeconomics. I read um, William Greider's book, Secrets of the Temple. <laughs> and the, the name sounds worse than the book because it's actually a fairly interesting read of this time, this period. And he gives these accounts of how these governors were really stressed out because of this, the double dip recession in the 80s. They were thinking long term. Politicians were thinking short term. He tells that Volcker got death threats. I mean, what, what is your take on that time? It was a very difficult time. And Paul Volcker, uh, exhibit an enormous courage to stick with what he knew was right for the American people over the long run. Yeah. So we had, I remember uh, one day when tractors, the farmers came to town and they surrounded the building with tractors. Really? Yes. And then there were consumer activists who also were demonstrating, there were not infrequently demonstrations outside the Federal Reserve Board uh, Volcker invited the consumer activist in to talk to them, or I think he maybe went out on the steps and, and interacted with him itself. I think a, a, a great thing to do. He agreed with, and the, the woman who was running this, uh, consumer activist, um, outfit was Gail Sincata, Sincata was her name. And, um, uh, he agreed with her to send staff and governors out to various locations. She said, you're not feeling the pain. You're not okay. connecting with the people. So he said, okay, you set up meetings and we'll attend them and you can, ex you can let us know what it feels like out there. So the meeting I went to was in Seattle and, um, it was difficult, I would say. <laughs> so uh, they put us – I was there with uh, uh, the person who was the head of the Consumer Affairs Division at the time. And they put us in a class – it was in a Catholic school on a Saturday morning. They put us in a classroom and kind of whipped the crowd into a frenzy. Oh, and then wonderful. we entered to boos and hisses <laughs> and uh, they tried to um, – elicit personal financial uh, information, uh, and this person was with me, was very good at resisting this. But it was very difficult. And some other people in other locations had even tougher time than I did. But I th uh, And uh, Chairman Volcker awarded everybody who went out to these meetings a, a purple heart, a little cloth purple heart. And I, unfortunately, I've lost mine. I wish I, I, wish I oh, still had it. Um, and then at the end, they came in and he was subject to the same things we were. But I, I think the, the, the story here is, um, it was very difficult and we knew people were suffering. The other anecdote is, uh, builders sent in little pieces of two by fours, uh, with the message, with mail, with a stamp on it. With a message, um, if it weren't for you, this would be used in building houses. 
Uh, so everybody was upset. It was a tough time. The unemployment rate got to 10% or so, which seemed high at the time. Um, and it, and it was a stop start situation. Remember, there were credit controls put in in 1980, I think, with the Carter administration trying to short circuit the, um, tight monetary policy. By short circuit, I mean, uh, attack the, problem of overborrowing and overspending in a more direct way through credit controls. So to, to reduce hmm. the pain, it didn't work. It just made everything worse. But it also interfered with the signals monetary policy. Right. So we eased up for a while, then we had to tighten again. So it was kind of a double dip recession. And it wasn't until the middle, late 82 that you could see that Inflation really was receding. The pressure on the financial system was very intense. That was Mexico uh, started having That's problems right. in the middle of 82. And, and the money supply, we were using the money supply as a very strong signal for what should happen to interest rates. It was feeding through the demand for reserves. And that was allowing the federal funds rate to get up to 20, 22%. Not, you know, it's hard Mind to think about. In this day right. Age, right. Now we worry about the zero lower bound. <laughs> right. There we were testing infinity <laughs> on the upside. Um, uh, and, and it varied over quite a wide range, several percentage points, sometimes between meetings because it was being driven by the demand for reserves, which was in turn tied to the behavior of M1 money supply. Okay. Now, Part of what happened in the early 1980s was deregulation, and deregulation changed the character of deposits and the demand for deposits. So I think the pressure on the financial system, the deregulation, the fact that inflation was coming down uh, pretty dramatically meant that we kind of backed off of the tight policy at the uh, second half, particularly the fall of 1982. One thing I've wondered about Paul Volcker is all the pressure he went through and all all the threats he got. I mean, the intense suffering all of you you went through. Could he have done it in a more modern age? And by, by that I mean, you know, today there's like twenty four seven cable news. There's Twitter, social media. I mean, it, I want to give him credit for what he did and the spine that he had. But do you think it's harder to be a central banker today, a chair today, versus then, given the constant Scrutiny, or was it just as intense no, back then? I think it was just as intense okay. back then. There might it might be louder now in some sense, but the Congress was upset. Someone, I think, it was Henry Gonzalez, introduced an, a, an impeachment thing against Volcker. Really? Yeah. So I mean, wow. it wasn't. Don't I mean, it was not easy times. And I think if you read Paul Volcker's book, Keeping at It, I think it's called. Um, You'll see his focus on price stability is absolutely undiminished and unchanged yes. over the decades. And he doesn't like the 2% inflation target. It's too high, too precise and too high. And I've had this discussion with him many times trying to convince him that it was okay and there are reasons for having a 2% target. Um, so what would he prefer, he, like a 0% with a band around it? or Yeah, I think 0 to 2 okay. uh, would, 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 His be, ideal. would be from him something there, but he probably wouldn't even be so precise. I mean, he's, he's one that started – uh, inflation should be low enough that households and businesses don't have to take it, take it into account when making decisions. Greenspan also had that definition independently. Uh, so I think it's get it low enough for that. And I think Paul Volcker would say 2% is a doubling every 36 years. That's not low enough. Um, you can argue with them about distortions in the price index. It doesn't sure. matter. But I think his book shows the, the, his focus that the job of the central bank is price stability. And from that will flow good economic performance. And in fact, from Paul Volcker's, um, performance in 79 to 82, we had the great moderation That's from, right. The early 80s to 2006. And I think a lot of it had to do with getting inflation down, anchoring those expectations, 
Alan Greenspan took the foundation Paul Volcker laid and built this structure on top of it of getting inflation expectations and anchoring them even further. And I can tell you from personal experience dealing with uh, Greenspan that he paid a lot of attention to inflation expectations in the early 90s when the Bush 41 administration was unhappy with interest rates. They wanted them lower because we had a, a jobless recovery and they were worried Um he had his eye, he, Alan Greenspan, had his eye on inflation expectations, and he said, we've paid, the economy has paid a big price for getting them down. They're not going to rise. We want to, if anything, keep keep that progress. So uh, I think the two of them together established the price stability that we've lived with uh, since 2000. It's interesting. Paul Volcker's still with us. Yes. You think all of that would have taken a toll on his health, <laughs> or maybe it did. And he's just he's just got well, great uh, genes and can live a long life. Uh, well, his health actually isn't good, but okay. uh, I don't think it has anything to do with the uh, stress that he was Hadn't under. Uh, he's a public servant, and mm. uh, he loves public policy. If you read his book, and I recommend it to all the listeners. Uh, a lot of it has to do with international financial developments. He was in the Treasury Department under the Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon administration, dealing with international financial developments and trying at first to save Bretton Woods and then to reform it uh, in a way that would uh, be a more – Provide a more stable basis for international uh, international finance. So that was a a big part of his life. Even you mentioned eighty two, the the Mexico crisis. That was a big part of his life at the Fed too. Right. I, I, I can say that because fresh out of grad school, my first job was at the U.S. Department of Treasury International Affairs, right. where he used to work. But in any event. One of my uh, mindless jobs they gave me with my PhD, <laughs> I had to go through and they're they're getting rid of some old documents. And I had to go. Th- we had to go through and read which ones could we get rid of or save. And, and some of them were from the early '80s, mm. and they were Paul Volcker and the Treasury yeah. Secretary at the time. They were discussing right. what to do with Mexico, and it was right. actually a very fascinating read. The discussions they were having, what to do with the big crisis coming out of Mexico. That's right. And Volcker, from his perch at the Fed, was uh, very involved in dealing with the banks and dealing with Mexico. Um, uh, trying to solve this and cooperating closely with the U.S. Treasury Department, which he recognized on an international financial crisis would would be the lead agency. But he had a lot of expertise yeah. and ideas about how to deal with it. We'll make sure to have a link on our webpage uh, for the book. All right, you mentioned Alan Greenspan. One of the things he's known for is is being a sage when it comes to productivity numbers, being ahead of the curve. Right. What can you tell us about that story? So I think uh, I, I really enjoyed working with Alan Greenspan, and he likes to say I was his mentor when he <laughs> came to the Federal Reserve. I'm not sure I want all that credit, uh, but uh, and I've remained close to him uh, since he left and I left the Federal Reserve. Um, he's an intensely analytic guy, very empirical, and from his days at Townsend Greenspan as a consultant in the private sector and even, uh, uh, yes, uh, had a very deep knowledge of statistical series and uh, from all sources, both private and public series, had done modeling himself so he knew how this process worked. And he – like to delve into these these various series, look for clues that something unexpected was happening underneath. Um, I, I used to kid him that he could take one bad series and divide it by another bad series and come up with an interesting <laughs> statistic that meant something. Uh, uh, nice. So, yeah. so uh, he, but this is the productivity thing. So he felt like. The aggregate data on productivity, um, profits, something wasn't adding up. 
And uh, he dug underneath using uh, the staff of the Federal Reserve. Uh, Larry Slifman was a staff member very involved in this in research and statistics and looked at eventually, I think, non-financial corporate profits and productivity, trying to find the series that did have good data that were based on 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 less assumptions, the way service sector and government and stuff and agriculture is more estimated. So he dug down and he thought he could see in the behavior of profits and the behavior of productivity that something deeper was going on and something more lasting was going on. So yes, he saw that and it was greeted with considerable skepticism, including inside the Federal Reserve. Really? Yes. So I think Larry Meyer, who was a governor at the time, and Janet Yellen, offices two down from me here now, um, went uh, tell a story. I think Larry in his book tells a story about going – the two of them going to Greenspan and saying, we need to raise rates because we think the unemployment rate is dropping and the economy is growing too fast. And he's saying, you know, be patient. This is a productivity boost that is going to come through in the numbers. So unit labor costs aren't rising so fast. There won't be the pressure on inflation you're afraid of. Uh, you're concerned about and prevailing in that argument because the data ended up supporting his uh, his proposition. But he got it by digging underneath the aggregate data that most of us rely on and knowing those data very, very closely and where they came from, the strengths and weaknesses. Very interesting. Well, this takes us up to your period, and that's 2002 now. You were appointed as a governor. What big changes did you experience going from a staffer to a governor? There were changes. Um, and I think one of the things that I missed going from staffer to governor were some of the really vigorous discussions we used to have on the staff putting the forecast together. And uh, it's hard when you're in the decision-making position, my, what I discovered was that the staff would put the forecast together, and I knew that there were disagreements that, you know, but, that, but once the forecast was put together, they kind of united behind it. So I, I felt a little um, isolated in some sense from some of the discussion that was going on, and I worked hard at regenerating that, um, being part of that uh, very intense uh, examination, what's happening, what could be causing it, what not. Um, so I, I actually, of course, I was interacting with staff very a lot, but I, I missed some of the I miss some of the give and take that happened as I moved from governor to staff and of course, or from staff to governor. And of course, you're in a different, it's a different flavor. You're a decision maker and you take responsibility for your decision. Um, no longer can you say, well, I told them what to do, but those whatever didn't do what I told them to do. Now you're those whatever, right? And right. you're doing it and you're taking responsibility <laughs> Um, and that, so it feels different. And, um, it was, I mean, I enjoyed it. The other difference, um, was the public aspect of being a governor. So I think very appropriately, the staff participates in academic conferences all the time, comments on papers, gives little papers, things like that. As a governor, as, as a policymaker, you are appropriately expected to go out and explain your policy to the wider public. And that was new for me. Uh, um, and I think I relaxed into that role uh, as the years went on, but it was uh, – that was it was a a big difference and one I had to embrace over time. And I was also as a staff member, you don't have newspaper people hanging or cable news people hanging on your every word. They don't care what the staff says or for all practical purposes. But when you're a policymaker, then they're paying a lot more attention to you. So getting used to that public spotlight 
getting used to testifying in front of Congress, um, uh, advocating and defending what the Fed was and explaining what the Fed was doing. This public role was a different one for me. Um, and one that, uh, took a little while to get used to. There wasn't, it wasn't a, I would, didn't feel natural to me at the time. It feels much more natural now, but it didn't, it didn't then. It seems like that, that'd be one of the hardest transitions because you have to be more guarded now, don't you? Yes. You, you can't just say, Hey, what's up? Call right. your friend and right. shoot the bull about Marcus because right. then they could quote you and Marcus could. Right. 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 And I, right. I, I feel bad for all the, the chairs for regional presidents. And they've gotten in trouble because they've things have slipped, especially right. when they're on the job first as the chair. I mean, I, I right. think it'd be very tough for anyone to always get it right. Right, and I think people should give more scope or give consideration when policymakers are speaking off the cuff. So it's one thing to have something in a speech that's thoroughly vetted by sometimes your fellow policymakers, if you're testifying for the system, for the Federal Reserve Board, uh, then other board members will read the speech. And obviously, the staff works very hard on those testimonies. Um, the staff helps you with the, with the speech. Um, but as a, as a board, but when you're speaking off the cuff, you may not say exactly what you want to say and think um at the time and those words can be misinterpreted it's interesting talking about transitions among chairmen so in the 90s some staff members went to alan greenspan and said the head of the bundesbank has a press conference i think after every policy meeting would you consider doing that and Greenspan said no, that uh, I think he felt like the co potential costs of not saying quite right, the right thing outweighed the benefits of explaining it. Interesting. Now, when Ben Bernanke came into office, one of his main uh, goals, objectives for his term in office was to increase the transparency of the Fed. So he um, instituted uh, press conferences uh, four, four times a year. Uh, and now Jay Powell is going to go to eight times a year press conferences. I was told the other day, by the way, that the ECB, which took up the Bundesbank press conference after every policy meeting, has gone back to four a year. So I, huh. I, I'm not – There's I, some fine-tuning potentially. Right. But it's the press conference is uh, a good innovation – uh, it must, it gives the chair a chance to present the collective judgment of the committee and where it came out and explain why it came out the way it did before other committee members and the newspapers and the cable right. channels interpret things. So he can shape, he or she can shape the interpretation the way the market, the way the market sees things. Speaking of transparency, it's my understanding that it was the mid-90s before the Fed began to release um, its target officially. Is that right? Or, or I some think kind it of was either early 93 or early 94, one of those okay. two. I can't remember. Yeah. Right. So yes. I'm curious as a staff <clears throat> member, were you aware of the targets? Before, when, so when oh, the yes. Fed wasn't released, you, so you guys knew what it was and you just couldn't oh, say anything? Well, I think – that's right. So, uh, in effect, the targets were released after the next FOMC meeting when the minutes came out. But everybody knew. Everybody in the market uh, knew th almost the next day. And this became even more refined uh, after 1989, I think. There was something that became known inside the institution as the Thanksgiving turkey. This was a situation in which the day after Thanksgiving, the New York Fed in executing open market operations executed an operation that the market interpreted as uh, – because markets were figuring out what the Fed wanted to do by looking at the operations that the New York Fed did. 
what were the type of operations, how strong were they relative to expectations, et cetera. And they did something that the market interpreted in a particular way that wasn't consistent with the committee's okay. desire, and they moved rates. Now, there's <laughs> a lot of discussion that – you know, things were – the staffs of the money market firms were understaffed on the Friday after Thanksgiving, and this never would have – but anyhow, after that, the uh, desk signals about what was going on were very precise. So I would say, yes, the Fed started announcing, let's say, early 94. It was a February, uh, either 93 or 94, um, but – well, in fact, it was when the first increase happened, when the Fed's fund rate had been stuck at three for many years. And, um, but even before that, everybody knew. So it wasn't really it was an open a, secret. It was an open secret. Uh, okay. uh, well signaled by the New York Fed's actions in the market. But it was the first time this thing had been announced right after the committee meeting. It started out, the announcement started out. As um, Chairman Alan Greenspan announced, so it was really okay. a Greenspan announcement, and then um, the announcement was pretty short. And in fact, sometimes I think at least the initial few, I'd have to go back and review, didn't even say what the funds rate was, but it would say um, tighten slightly or ease slightly and that would mean 25 or, or you know there was there was coded language that everybody knew and that gradually evolved to much more yeah. precise thing and it also evolved in the way that the open market committee said uh after a couple of years well wait a second this is obviously an extremely important um piece of transparency about what we're doing we want to have some say in here. So we would like to help Alan Greenspan okay. <laughs> compose these things in the, in the mid to late nineties. So I was the staff member in charge of monetary policy and he and I would put these things together over the weekend, like fax to his fax. We'd do a test fax first to make sure we had the, we didn't put a wrong number in. <laughs> uh, and we'd talk a little bit on Monday morning and that would be the thing. And then, but, um, it was way too important to leave to, to one person. To one person. Yeah. It was interesting. So this week on the show, so we're recording this, uh, January 17th, but this week on the podcast, I have Craig Torres from Bloomberg News. Uh -huh. yeah. He actually tells about when he started, Following the Fed in the late eighties, that they actually at Bloomberg, they actually maybe he was with someone else, but even he started covering the Fed. They had market guys in the newsroom with them who would interpret, like you were saying, okay. repo market actions, okay. and then, okay. then he could write down <coughs> what had happened. They, yeah. they needed a market guy in the newsroom. Yeah. So, so reporters today have it very easy <laughs> compared right. to them. Well, let's talk about your time as vice chair. So you become vice chair in two thousand six. Were you appointed the same time Bernanke was appointed then or at different no. times of the year? Uh, so he was appointed and became chair on February 1st, 2006. And uh, I think Roger Ferguson was the vice chair at the time. And Roger, um, I don't think his term was up. I think he just left. I can't remember whether his term was up or he just left. Okay, um, But uh, – and uh, – then asked me, did I, would I be his vice chair? And I was very flattered and uh, said, yes, of course, I'll be, be happy to um, help you out in any way I can. So, and that would, that started in June. So I think okay. my, my term started in June, but I had to go through another, um, Senate conference. I had to be nominated by President Bush again. He had nominated me in 2002. And then um, confirmed by the Senate. Well, you picked a great time to become vice chair, huh? <laughs> they, they were interesting times. You, had a, you became vice chair just as the uh, great, the early signs of the Great Recession were beginning to show. That's right. So, tell us about that experience. I mean, many sleepless nights. I imagine that's much Maybe. stress. I mean, right. echoing back to the early eighties. <laughs> right. So, right. It was a very stressful period. So it was really August of '07 mm -hmm. when um, I guess. BNP Paribas yes. couldn't uh, said they they there was so much uncertainty about 
subprime mortgages. They couldn't price their funds uh, that specialized in that. And that followed in June a Bear Stearns thing in which they stepped back from one fund but made good on another fund. So this thing had been building all year. Um, but the, uh, what started in the Europe, in Europe actually, uh, in, in this French bank, uh, quickly spread to interbank markets everywhere. So there, people realized that it was, impossible really to know what the value of these subprime, particularly derivatives and tranches were. Um, they didn't know who was holding them. And all of a sudden, the interbank funding markets um, became disrupted and banks were holding back on lending to other banks in these funding markets. So our first – and that happened in August of 07. And our first response was, well, this is a liquidity problem for these banks that are having trouble borrowing. The usual – the money markets aren't working very well. This is a classic thing where the central bank should intervene and make liquidity available. So our first response was to um, – reduce the penalty on the discount rate and encourage banks to borrow at the discount window. I can remember being part of a um, of a conference call with the New York Clearinghouse at the time with Tim Geithner, and we our mantra was borrowing from the Fed is a sign of strength, not of weakness. It didn't work. Uh, so <laughs> the stigma of borrowing from the Fed, even though the Fed didn't publish who was borrowing, yeah. people could see by district by district and uh, could almost by a process of elimination figure out that Bank X might be borrowing from discount window, which meant that it was facing higher charges mm -hmm. in the private market, which meant that it was weak. So no one wanted to come in and borrow from the discount window. And this, the stigma was um, inhibiting the ability of the Federal Reserve to add to the liquidity of the system at a time when liquidity was being constrained. At the same time, we could see that this constraint on liquidity and the interference with the free flow of credit around the banking system was going to have adverse effects on households and business access to credit, particularly mortgage credit, but not only mortgage credit as, as uh, lenders became concerned about perceptions of their credit worthiness, they would withdraw into themselves and, and be extra safe in order to maintain their own access to markets. So we did ease monetary policy in several stages through that, through the fall of 07. And in December of 07, we opened a new type of discount window facility called the TAF, the term auction facility, that auction credit to banks on a regular basis over a longer time. It was like 30 days, 60 days, et cetera. And that facility overcame the stigma because everybody was coming in for the auction Um it wasn't just one or two. You didn't get the funds that day. You got the next day, which meant even if you got the funds, it didn't mean you were going to run out of money that day. That wasn't a signal. So that was uh, more successful. But the economy peaked in December 07, as the NBR told us a year or so <laughs> later. Uh, and it started to slide pretty quickly in 08. Uh, we cut rates massively in January of 08. We did 75 basis points between the December meeting and the January meeting and another 50, I think, at the January meeting. So in one month, we cut interest rates one and a quarter percent, and then we cut them again after the Bear Stearns episode of early March. One of the challenges you faced, all of Fed officials faced, is this this data. You just mentioned MBR told you a year late, right. you know. But GDP numbers, for example, the uh, third or fourth quarter GDP in two thousand eight didn't show the severity until like the revisions in the following Absolutely. year. So, if you could play God with <laughs> economic data, and you could wave a wand and and get the Real-time data, what would you have wanted in 2008 that you could see in real time if it were possible? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, I think you've pointed to 
it, it wasn't only the data that lagged and then were revised. And the third quarter of 2008 yeah. is a great example because in the summer of 2008 at the Jackson Hole Conference, Stan Fisher, who was then the head of the Bank of Israel, stood up and said, why is it that we can see this – this seems like a very severe financial crisis. It's not being reflected in the data. Yeah. Now, we know – several revisions later that the third quarter was already on a downward slide, which of course was accelerated in the post uh, Lehman uh, freezing up of, uh, of markets. Um, I, I think there's in, in her, inherently the data are going to be revised. I don't think there's a magic wand here, but the other, the other thing to say about coping with the, with a situation, a crisis situation like this, it's not only the incoming economic data, but it's interpreting what's happening in the financial markets and knowing, trying to get good information from people in the markets about what they're seeing, who's frozen out, who's got access, who do they expect to be in trouble next, um, how, how, how might the authorities react to that? Interpreting the incoming information is very, very hard. And you have to keep in mind that everybody you're talking to uh, has an agenda. And they want you to think in a particular way because their firm is in trouble or maybe their firm is strong and the other firm's right. in trouble and they see a business opportunity. So it's really – and you have to have knowledgeable people around you. So I would say uh, one thing to say about this period is there was a triumvirate at the Fed. So Chairman Bernanke, myself, and Kevin Warsh met daily, often multiple times a day – trying to figure out what was going on, what the right next steps were. And Kevin Warsh was really important to this because he had had experience in Morgan Stanley and financial markets. He had great contacts in financial markets, and he helped us interpret, uh, figure out what was happening. Also important in this is that, in my view, is to have bank supervisors around. So, the bank supervisors inside the Fed were familiar with a lot of the banks and their problems. Now, remember, the budget dictum is to lend at a penalty rate to uh, to lots of folks, but solvent folks. So you could turn to the supervisors and say, do you think Bank X is fundamentally solvent, that once this crisis is through, they'll be back on their feet? Or, is, or are they so sick and so impaired that they'll never recover and we need to think of other ways of dealing with this? Um, so it was uh, having those folks, Kevin in the, in the, among the triumvirate and, uh, the Spank supervisors with knowledge of what was going on and it was really important to, operating the discount window and to making uh, monetary policy. But you're, it's the fog of war. Absolutely. Right. Uh, right. Things are much clearer in retrospect than they are at the time. So in the time we have left, I want to switch to a, a paper, a talk you gave recently at a conference that we had, I attended as well um, in January. And the paper deals with the strategy, tools, and communication of the Federal Reserve. And one of the backdrops to this is this this um, reexamination the Board of Governors, the Fed's going to have internally. Also, apparently, they're going to bring outside input into it. And then in June this year, they're going to have a big conference. Right. And so you had some great thoughts to share on that. And, and uh, let, let's just begin by talking about strategy. What were your thoughts on strategy? So I think uh, – so first thing to say is I I really welcome the uh, ins the impetus, the innovation really of the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve System. It's not just the board. It's the board and Entire the reserve system. banks yeah. to run an open process. 
invite outside comments. I mean, the Fed's always getting outside comments. But this case, the Fed is organizing the thing, bringing outsiders in, and presumably will um, respond to to what they hear. So I think this is a, a, a good inner innovation run by Chairman Powell and Vice Chairman Rich Clarida. Uh, so that's the first thing to say. I think on the strategy, a really key issue, as you know, David, <laughs> is what to do about the zero lower bound. Yeah. So we have nominal interest rates that look like they're going to be secularly lower than we're used to. So we're used to equilibrium rates of two, two and a half percent, and then uh, inflation on top of that. So that gives you the four to five percent and before the Fed even tightens. So you might be up at six or seven when a recession hits, uh, or at least at five or so when a recession hits. Right. And in the past, when recessions have hit, the Fed has had to ease four to five percentage points to fight the recession, to keep inflation from dropping below its target and to keep unemployment from rising excessively now uh, with uh, many people thinking that the real interest rate, uh, equilibrium interest rate might be in the neighborhood of one with a 2% inflation target that gives you a nominal rates in, in a resting spot, an equilibrium spot of three. Now, um, I think when the next crisis hits, the, it might be from a position when the Fed is a little tighter because it's fighting inflation, but it doesn't really matter. There's a, there's a risk that the next time there's a recession, the Fed will get to zero pretty quickly. Then what do you do? And so I think the a key, that's a very important strategy issue. And it's particularly even more important than it might have been. 10 years ago because fiscal policy is hamstrung. It's hamstrung by the fact that the U.S. is running massive deficits in the best of times. Right. Debt to GDP going up given the tax cuts and spending increases the last Congress and president put into place. Um, so that'll, that'll hamstring people and the political environment is so toxic. So I worry that fiscal policy won't be there to move in the same direction as monetary policy in the next recession. You need to rely more on the Fed. Um, it's not, there are a couple avenues here that the Fed will be exploring. One is what about these unconventional monetary policies that we because I was inside at the time, used in 2008, 2009, 2010, taking rates to zero, but also giving very strong guidance that they would remain at zero for uh, quite some time. So that helps to reduce expectations about future rates and long-term rates and helps uh, bolster asset markets and uh, reduce the cost of capital. And also QE, what we officially called large-scale asset purchases, right. uh, buying intermediate and long-term treasury bonds, or in the case of last, uh, last episode, because it was mortgage market, um, mortgage market centered, uh, mortgage backed securities as well. Um, so I think the Fed needs to say, when we get down towards zero, here's how we're going to structure our unconventional monetary policies again the next time. We've learned some lessons from our experience. So the next set of QEs, the next uh, forward guidance might look something like this. Here's how we're going to do it or how we're thinking of doing it and the order in which we'll do it. I think they should also explore some supplemental things. Um, could they reduce rates below zero? So we went to 12 basis points. We had a zero to 25 range. Could you take rates lower as the ECB, Swiss National Bank, and others have done? What's the lessons from that? What are the costs and benefits? It's not... It's not a slam dunk that it's a good thing to do. You need to think sure. about it. It can have an effect on banks, et cetera. And what about schemes like the Bank of England ran, which gave banks incentives to make loans 
uh, tied to the cost of their funds from the Bank of England. So run, running schemes to do that. So that can, I think you can supplement the decline from say three to zero with these unconventional policies. There will be worth something, but they may not be. Even that may not be enough. So lots of people, including you, David, <laughs> have thought about how to structure monetary policy strategies under these situations. One um, one option is to go for a higher inflation rate. Right. So go for 4% so you have higher nominal rates when you begin. I think that's not consistent with the congressional mandate for price stability. <laughs> Paul Volcker thinks two is too high. Surely four would be (laughs) way too high. That would not be good for his health. Uh, And then, so let's rule that out. And and I, I, my impression is that the the Fed isn't seriously considering that. But there are other things, such as your nominal income targeting, price level targeting, uh, that have different characteristics and their characteristic they often have is you get to the zero lower bound and you want the level of prices or the level of nominal GDP right. to return to the previous trend, the 2% trend for prices or the four or whatever percent right. trend for nominal GDP. That dictates that the funds will be held at zero, the target rate will be held at zero for much longer. And that you'll have a period, for the most part, of somewhat higher inflation. Right. That doesn't mean that the long-term 2% goal has to be abandoned, but you'll have some short-term increases in inflation. So I think the uh, the attractiveness of those plans are that they give you a systematic way of saying – how long, how long, what are the conditions under which I might rise from zero? Those conditions are delayed relative to sort of ordinary Taylor rule type monetary mm-hmm. policies. The expectations of low rates get built into financial markets and maybe the expectations of higher inflation also get built in. Right. And that's helpful to you as well. And I think the problem with those things is they're complicated. They're difficult to ex- – I just tried to explain it. I'll leave it to the listeners whether they <laughs> whether that was successful. But they do imply a fairly complex messaging. And when would you tighten and where did that trend come from and how long will inflation have to overshoot and what are the risks of inflation overshooting? So I think this is uh, – there are pros and cons to all these plans and there are other plans of a, of a similar – nature. And I guess where I came out in the uh, talk I gave for uh, for the Institute for Humane Economics, Humane Studies, Humane Studies, yeah. Humane Studies and Mercatus was I, th- I wonder whether the Fed can't just double down on risk management. So when you get close to zero, just say the risks of getting caught at zero are very high. Uh, I'm going to ease rapidly. I'm going to hold that easing for quite a long period of time. Take some chances that inflation will rise above two without explicitly aiming for inflation above two. There are, um, folks have said to me, uh, yeah, but it won't, that won't be enough. You need to do more. I think this is an empirical question. I think the other, another issue that I raised in the talk that I, I'd like to, add here is that I think the financial stability aspects are important. How do we get stuck at two, at zero in 2008? Because there was a shock to the economy, house prices fell, and that shock was multiplied and amplified tremendously through the financial system. So I think strengthening the financial system helps to mitigate and reduce the odds on getting stuck at zero. So I'd like to see the Fed pay more attention to so-called macro prudential policy. The capital Ma- buffer. The- capital uh, capital buffer that builds up in good times yeah. that can be released in bad times because it's high enough in good times that even releasing, reducing the regula- regulatory requirements in bad times, the capital is still high enough that banks – that that people who lend to banks and wholesale markets have confidence that they can continue to lend and the banks have confidence they can continue to make loans. I mean, what made the recession so bad was 
uh, not just the collapse in house prices and subprime lending. It was how it spread to the whole financial system. So even uh, households that had good jobs and were going to keep good jobs, businesses that had good prospects uh, that were going to continue couldn't get funding for buying a new house or a new car. In the case of a household, a capital project that might Take, take, you know, expand the business, uh, in the case of a business. So when those credit markets froze up, that's what really caused the problem. So I think we need to pay more attention to, uh, structuring regulatory policies that keep the credit markets from freezing up in bad times. Well, we are almost out of time, but I have one last question at this conference we were at. Um, both Joe Gagnon and then George Selgin in different ways both propose expanding the uh, type of assets the Fed could purchase. Now, now George is more kind of like a term auction facility where any counterparty, not just the primary dealers, any counterparty could bring an asset. You could, you know, you could put a haircut on it if it wasn't great. And Joe just in general was arguing, I think, you know, go beyond, you know, government securities. What thoughts do you have on those proposals? So I think the the Fed has already expanded its counterparties in uh, in a reverse RP okay it's fair. Uh, uh, reverse RP facilities, but it hasn't expanded the collateral. So that's an open market operation. Open market operations are confined to Treasury and agency yep. securities. Uh, so the counterparty point, I think they're already dealt with to some okay. extent. The Federal Reserve Act doesn't allow them to do open market operations and corporate bonds and whatnot. And I think that's a tough, difficult step to take because then you get into the Federal Reserve making judgments about the, the credit quality of the assets it's buying, having real effects on allocation across firms and taking fiscal risks. Yep. I mean, your listeners who buy corporate bonds or even commercial papers we we saw in 2008 are taking risks. When the Bank of England buys corporate bonds, they do it with an agreement with the Treasury, with Her Majesty's Treasury, about risk sharing. And um, they wouldn't undertake it without – because they are taking fiscal risks. So I think it raises – I wouldn't rule it out. But I think if to expand the array of um, assets into riskier credit risk, uh, I think would take working closely with the Treasury and making sure that the Fed, uh, any monitor, any fiscal policy the Fed was indirectly undertaking by putting taxpayer money at risk would uh, be done uh, knowingly, cooperatively, openly with the fiscal authorities as well. So your proposal then in this talk to summarize is stick to a flexible inflation targeting is, and you stress the flexible part. So it's truly right. symmetric. Um, be willing to use negative rates if needed yep. and use macro potential regulation and Risk better risk management in general, right. and run with it. Is right. that a fair summary? Yes, in terms of the strategy. Yes. Okay, so with right. those tools and specify ahead of time. Look carefully right. at your tools. Specify ahead of time what you're going to do, and then my last set of recommendations was about communication. I like the way Jay Powell and the Fed have gone to communicating in plainer English with more people, and I think they should continue. To, I think it's really important to build up public understanding of the Federal Reserve. If I think back to your question about the crisis and our response, if I think there was a deficiency somewhere, it wasn't in the response in what we did. I think we did what we had to do and we were successful in limiting the damage, um, but we didn't explain it as well as we could have and we didn't reach out as well. And I think that um, fed back on a decline in confidence in the central bank. All right. So better communication. Well, that's what we're doing here. We're communicating with a former Fed official, Don Cohn. Don, thanks for being a guest on the show. Thank you, David. It's been fun. It's been fun reminiscing with you. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. 
This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.